Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 40th salon. We are so happy to have you with us. Today's topic is the truth, the gift of truth in peace and war. Our series is hosted by Genevieve Vaughn and the International Feminists for the Gift Economy. I am Leticia Layson, your moderator. We're happy to have Medea Benjamin, Karina Kylo, Paula Macchiori with us today. Each of our presenters will speak for um, 20 to 25 minutes, which will give us ample time for questions and discussion at the end. So let's begin. Our first speaker is Medea Benjamin. Medea is the co-founder of a woman-led peace group, Code Pink, and the code and the co-founder of a human rights group, Global Exchange. Medea's latest book, War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless War, was released in November. She is the author of 10 other books, including Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control, and Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection and Inside Iran, The Real Politics and Politics of Islamic Rep Republic of Iran. Her articles appear regularly in outlets such as The Guardian, The Huffington Post, Common Dreams, Alternet, and The Hill. Medea can be found on Twitter. So please, Medea, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be with you all. And I love looking in the chat and seeing uh, people coming from all over the world, from Germany, Canada, Senegal, Albania, US, and many other places. Um, it's very heartwarming to be with a group of women that cares about how are we going to move this world from one of militarization and war uh, to one of love and compassion and peace uh, at this time when uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is raging? Uh, it's um, important that we get together like this to not only educate each other, but talk about what are we going to do uh, in this uh, level of insanity. I see the women in Ukraine and so many of them having to flee their countries and live in other lands by the millions. Um, and I see the, the brutal Russian invasion that is now targeting uh, the, uh, the infrastructure so that millions of people during a cold winter uh, will be facing lack of electricity and water and heating. And uh, you see the West just pouring in weapons, adding fuel to the fire, uh, and wonder what is this world that we have created? Uh, the level of militarism is out of control. Here in the United States, uh, the Congress is just passing a Pentagon budget that is $857 billion. And if you count in all the other parts uh, that are not included, but are part of the militarism like nuclear uh, uh, weapons and veterans affairs, it's close to a trillion dollars. This is for one year. Uh, and meanwhile, we have no decent healthcare system in this country. Uh, the students are left with a incredible uh, debt bondage when they graduate from college and can't get the jobs they want because they don't pay enough, so they have to go into the jobs they don't want. Um, and uh, the issue about the climate not being addressed and certainly not the levels of funding that should be put into that uh, when we're putting all this money into war. I've been part of a group called No to NATO for many years now, and we have always been saying that NATO is not a defensive organization. NATO is an offensive, dangerous organization that should have been disbanded when the Warsaw Pact, its counterpart in the Eastern Bloc, was disbanded. Um, but today we see this strengthening of NATO and the uh, war propaganda putting NATO forth as this, uh, this um, uh, savior 
organization. Uh, and in the United States, I feel that the mainstream media are not giving the context for this war. It's as if the war sort of fell from the sky because there's this horrific man named uh, Vladimir Putin who just decided from one day to the next that he was going to invade Ukraine. Um, we did this book to explain the context and uh, also a, an 18 minute video that I'm going to put in the chat that I hope you'll get a chance to watch afterwards. Um, we explained very clearly in the book that we have no desire to justify Russia's invasion. We think it is illegal, immoral, brutal, inhumane, violates the UN charter, uh, and we want people to understand why it happened. And I uh, do this from the point of view of someone living in the United States that doesn't have the ability to reach Vladimir Putin. I think uh, if I lived in Russia, I would probably be in jail as one of those who are protesting this war, uh, but I don't. I live in the United States. And so anything that my government has done to create this context is something that I feel obligated to educate people about and protest it. And so in that context, what we, I have been going around the country uh, trying to meet with student groups, with community organizations, with faith-based groups, uh, with anybody that I can get to talk to. Uh, I try to uh, get them to understand uh, the problem of NATO, and especially this issue of uh, NATO, of the U.S. going against its promise to Gorbachev in 1991 that NATO would not move one inch eastward, and um, how uh, NATO has not only moved one inch eastward, uh, it has moved to be right on Russia's border, uh, and how the promise to Ukraine uh, in 2008 that it would get a chance to join NATO uh, was something that did help create the context for this war. I also show NATO in the light of an aggressive organization by uh, explaining how NATO got involved in the bombing of Kosovo, but then got involved in areas way beyond NATO's uh, uh, geographical uh, 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 area uh, to join the U.S. in the invasion of uh, Afghanistan, of Libya, to come in after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, to get involved in that occupation. Uh, and so uh, having NATO surrounding uh, this hostile, um, aggressive alliance surrounding Russia uh, was a setup for conflict as many, many US diplomats and academics and experts in the region had warned over and over and over again, you're crossing a red line, this will lead to more conflict. And then of course came the 2014 uprising against an elected but corrupt government in Ukraine that was a popular peaceful uprising that was hijacked by uh, by uh, militant elements who turned it into a violent situation. But also we see the hand of the United States in trying to change a government that was uh, pro-Russia to one that was pro-West. And uh, there is this leaked um, uh, audio tape of the Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, uh, talking to the ambassador from the United States in Ukraine, uh, really uh, conniving, scheming about who they were going to put in as the head of state of Ukraine. Uh, and we also have the pictures of Victoria Nuland out in the square in Maidan, handing out cookies and uh, goodies to the protesters. And I wonder if the situation were reversed in, 2000, in, in last year when there was the uprising in the United States with the mob trying to take over our Congress, if there had been a Russian official in that group handing out goodies and saying, you know, go take over Congress, go overthrow your government, um, how that would be received here in the United States. All this to say that the 
uh, level of involvement of the US in trying to um, uh, determine the course of political events in Ukraine uh, is another issue that we have to highlight when talking to the American people. Um, with the uh, change in government in 2014, and then the breakaway republics in the Donbas and Russia taking over Crimea, uh, it uh, set the stage for the conflict that raged on in the Donbas for years. We do have the Minsk agreements uh, that was a, a way to try to end the conflict in the Donbas, bringing in 1,300 monitors and staff uh, from Europe actually did calm a lot of the fighting in the Donbas, but the political uh, part of those accords were never implemented. And it's interesting that last week we saw uh, an interview with Angela Merkel, uh, uh, former head of uh, Germany, saying that the Minsk Accords were really used to buy time. And the way that Ukraine and the West bought time was to uh, pour weapons into Ukraine, train the Ukrainian military uh, to set the stage for a conflict instead of really implementing those political accords. And she said in her interview, how could the Russians ever trust uh, negotiating with the West? Um, and of course, there is no trust on any side. Um, the Russians said they weren't going to invade. They did invade. The Russians have done all kinds of things to uh, violate the peace. Um, and are now uh, with sham referendums saying that a large swath of uh, Ukraine belongs to Russia. Uh, we have um, the, uh, the uh, after the uh, invasion here in the US, what we have seen is a constant stream of propaganda in the media uh, saying that Ukraine is about to win this war acting like if we only sent in billions and billions more of weapons, uh, victory would be around the corner. Of course, this is something we heard for 20 years with the US involvement in Afghanistan, that victory was around the corner until the US uh, pulled out and left Afghanistan back in the hands of the Taliban. Uh, we heard this in Iraq for many years as well. Uh, and we know that these days uh, there is no winning on the battlefield. And yet the media and the Biden administration give this impression uh, that Ukraine can do what it wants right now, which is get back every inch of territory, including all of the Donbas and Crimea. Meanwhile, inside the Pentagon, where the military has a, a long record from the days of Vietnam of losing wars, uh, they know what a losing war looks like. And so the uh, the uh, chair of the Joint Chief of Staff, um, Mark Milley, has, who is the number one military advisor to President Biden, uh, recently came out in both a public event and on TV interviews with quite remarkable statements that actually go against what the Biden administration has been saying. And what Mark Milley said is that Ukraine has done a victorious job on the battlefield trying to uh, push back the Russians, but that there is now a stalemate and that there will not be a military victory on the ground. Winter has set in that this is a good time to seize the moment when Ukraine is in a relative position of strength and go to the negotiating table. Uh, now, the fact that Mark Milley wasn't uh, fired after saying that uh, tells us a lot about the kind of uh, arguments and divisions that are going on within the Biden administration, the public view that victory is around the corner, and the private view uh, that this is just not rational, that Putin is not going to give up Crimea, uh, that they can't take back every inch of the Donbass, and that a compromise is necessary. When uh, there were uh, uh, possible that were when there were talks that were going on early after this war began. Uh, Zelensky himself said that it was going to be necessary for Ukraine to be a neutral country, not to be part of NATO, uh, but they needed security guarantees from powerful countries. Uh, now, of course, he's asking for fact, fast track into NATO, but I feel this is a bargaining position, just like uh, Russia's. Um, sham referendums 
in four regions in Ukraine, we're part of a bargaining position. So where does this lead us? Um, in the US, it's a miserable political situation where the progressive Democrats, a lot of whom are women, uh, who in the past have been the peacemakers, uh, whether it's voting against war in Iraq or uh, calling for troops to be withdrawn in other countries, uh, they now are following the line of the Biden administration uh, to pour more and more weapons and money into Ukraine. Uh, there was one letter that the progressive Democrats put out, they could only get 30 members of their caucus, their caucus is 100 members, they could only get 30 to sign on after much pushing from the base, from those of us who were doing our lobbying. Uh, and as soon, and that letter was extremely mild. It thanked Biden for all the support he had been giving to Ukraine. Uh, it did not say we should cut off the, uh, the uh, sending of weapons. It only said in addition to all the support, we should be calling for negotiations. The backlash against them was so strong that within 24 hours, they were pulling their own names off of that letter. And then finally, the head of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, withdrew the entire letter. There is only one person from those 30 that has been publicly uh, saying that it was a rational letter and that negotiations were a rational call. Uh, that is one uh, congressman from California, Ro Khanna. The rest have put their tails between their legs and, and walked backwards on this, uh, which is a terrible shame. And we have a lot of work to do uh, to get those members to come out again and saying, of course, negotiations is the way forward. In the meantime, there are uh, many Republicans, uh, unfortunately, many of them on the extreme right, who we, we, we would be against in all kinds of issues, uh, like one woman, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is so anti-immigrant and gay rights and is terrible on issues that we care about. She has been saying some of the most rational things, like we have so many unmet needs here at home. How can we be sending all this money to uh, continue a war in Ukraine? And some of the most right-wing commentators on Fox News are the only ones in the mainstream media uh, that are saying this as well. And then we have Donald Trump himself, who is saying that if he were in power, he would end this war because he would talk to Putin. Instead, you get Biden and you get war and you get Biden's refusal to talk to Putin. Uh, so we have a very, very strange political situation turned topsy-turvy where the uh, most natural peacemakers uh, are the ones that are pushing for war and where the war makers in the Republican Party on Fox News and in the Pentagon are the ones that are pushing for peace. Uh, so um, I hope in the discussion, we have more discussion about how that happened and what we can do. Um, in the meantime, one of the questions that I get most when we when I travel around with this book is, you can't talk to Putin. I have a very simple answer for that, and that is try and tell us the results. We want Biden to talk to Putin. We want our Secretary of State to do the job of a diplomat and talk to his counterparts. Uh, we believe that there have been examples of talks both between Ukraine and Russia that have been successful on things like getting 10 million tons of grain out of the country so it could feed people around the world. Uh, there have been talks about getting the International Atomic Energy Association into the Zaporizhia nuclear plant to stop it from being blown up. Um, there have been talks on prisoner swaps. We just saw the most uh, high profile one with Brittany Griner, but there have been prisoner swaps between Ukraine and Russia constantly happening that takes a lot of negotiations uh, to make those happen. And then between the United States and Russia, there haven't been talks on the issues that there must be talks around, like uh, the arms control uh, agreements that the U.S. has pulled out to, um, perhaps about the bases that the U.S. has that are surrounding Russia or the five European countries that have U.S. nuclear weapons. Uh, but there have been talks on the uh, by our Secretary of Defense, National Security Council, and head of the CIA with their Russian counterparts. What have they been talking about? They've been talking about their terrible fear of this 
war spinning out of control and turning into World War III, turning into a nuclear war. So they only talk about how to contain this war, not how to stop it. And we saw one of the biggest hawks, the head of NATO, Jan Stoltenberg, recently being asked, what is his greatest fear? And his greatest fear, he said, is this war spinning out of control and it can go horribly wrong. We, as women who have been trying to end the scourge of nuclear weapons around the entire world and support supporting the treaty ban at the United Nations, uh, know how horribly wrong this war can go. And so I think um, it's important to, uh, uh, let, uh, to remind people uh, about uh, the um, threat of nuclear war, not just being a, an idle threat, but something very, very real. Uh, and this be part of our push um, to get as many sectors of our society together to uh, push all of those parties uh, to the negotiating table. And so as I sum up, I just want to say a couple of the things that we have been doing. Um, we have been calling for a Christmas truce, uh, and to our delight, we thought it would be hard to get uh, faith-based leaders in the U.S. to sign on, um, and we were uh, pushing for 100 signing on. We have close to 1,000 who have signed on so far. Uh, and that is the basis for a campaign beyond the holidays uh, to be pushing for these people who have access to the White House to get meetings in the White House to push for negotiations. We're also pushing in the um, environmental community, which is a vibrant, strong youth-led uh, movement, unlike the peace movement in the U.S. that is basically uh, quite moribund uh, and led by older people like us, many of whom have the Vietnam uh, history as our uh, time of uh, uh, starting our activism. But the environmental movement uh, has to understand what a nuclear war would do to the environment, what the blowing up of uh, the infrastructure in Ukraine is doing to the environment, what the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline has done to the environment, uh, what the blowing up of a nuclear plant in Ukraine would do for the environment, and what the spending of just in the United States over $100 billion on this war uh, does to push militarism and environmental destruction uh, instead of putting our resources into dealing with the existential threat of the environment. So we are working with many young people uh, in the environmental movement to make this an issue that they join with us on, whether it's protests that we have planned like for January 14th, uh, or for uh, letters to the uh, White House or to pressure on Congress. Um, we're excited ab about getting uh, environmental movements involved with us. And um, finally, we have International Women's Day coming up on March 8th, and it would be wonderful among this group of women to think what we could do uh, as women in Europe, in the United States, around the world uh, to call for an end to this war and, of course, an end to all wars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Medea. You presented a very thorough overview and I look forward to time at the end when uh, questions can be posed and a discussion can happen. Our next speaker is um, Paula McYori. She's a feminist theorist, activist and writer, author of books, uh, producer of videos, articles on feminist issues. She has created nationally and internationally free spaces of critical thinking based on the model of the free universities. Her main idea, their main idea is to develop and make visible new paradigms of knowledge based on women's ways of thinking and knowing, working on an inter, in an interdisciplinary way across cultures, classes, and specializations. She is the founder and past president of the Women's Free University in Milan, a researcher and intercultural education association in Milan, um, Crinali. And she is a member of the International Feminist of University Network. You can read Paula's longer bio at the website, but for now, let's hear from Paola. Welcome, Paola. 
So hi everybody. Um, yeah, while you were you were talking about uh, our critical thinking, and I would say that in these times of uh, of uh, war, our critical thinking is very weak in terms of power. It is uh, very very easily uh, smashed against a majority and uh, it's very difficult to keep it uh, uh, in its strength okay this is just because you made me think about that the other thing is that <laughs> that <clears throat> the situation is really terrible from this side of the uh, sea of the ocean so one thing that i'm coming back from canada before I start, I just, this is one thing. Uh, and I realized that talking with friends, anti-war people, whatever, that being on that side of the ocean, meaning being far, is very powerful too. Because of this uh, sense of urgency that we have, this fear of the bomb that we have is, is really uh, very difficult, it's not shareable. I realize how the, the distance makes uh, ideological uh, issues or uh, really urgency because uh, of the fears, right? So I start, this is just to say a, a recent uh, realization, but I start with what I wanted to say. So may, I really liked the media book that I read all uh, carefully because she, she does what we should do to go to the truth. The title of this meeting is The Gift of the Truth. So the truth is at the end of a path. And in this situation, in this war, in this Ukrainian uh, situation, what we will discover, I think, terrible things at the end. And so to try to go nearer to the truth is uh, to try to make meaning, as her title says, make meaning of something that seems not to have any sensible meaning. And um, try to have, to go a little bit before what is presented to all people from the media, which is the present, the situation, the invasion, the aggression, the response to the aggression. So going a little bit before that and seeing what happened before. Minsk agreement, who talks about that? Nobody. Uh, identifying actors, responsibilities, responsibilities that are kept hidden and uh, that are masked by the present propaganda. So this is a, an attempt and uh, very, it's very useful. But uh, what I wonder is uh, to receive those truths or those hypotheses, those interpretation that makes a lot of sense uh, and with, with which I agree. I just will uh, add something from this side of the ocean, but I really agree with the analysis you know, of who started to uh, circum like the the Pope said, the NATO was barking at Putin uh, borders, and so uh, that was one of the beginnings. But uh, the problem today in this situation is, what are the conditions to receive those truths and to make something with them and to do something that can where they can be used and not only for a certain amount of people that already are in the discourse. How can you reuse those in a, in a more massive way for let's say normal people? Because when what uh, uh, happens here is that we are full of fear. And when there is too much fear, there, are, there is a need for stands very rough, uh, taking position, uh, there is a need, of, and it comes um, polarization, dichotomies, a primitive thinking where you have to take a stand and you simplify everything which is more complex. You lose any side of complexity, which is 
Complexity is, is even also the possibility to think in, other per, in the other part terms, to think from the two sides, the two different perspectives. There is only one perspective left when there is too much fear. So we, have, we are now in the fear of the winter too, because of the cold, Italy, eh? I'm talking about Italy, I would say France too, and Spain. So of the cold, of the poverty, because the sanctions are, are coming back to us much more than to, to Russia, it seems, of the, uh, of the consequences of, of the now, be, uh, of the inflation, of the fact that we see that the only uh, potence that is taking advantage of that is the US that is selling to Europe the gas three times they're more expensive than, than anybody else and so on. So the situation is that we see destruction, killings, death, civilians, that could be us. One of the things that was very interesting is that when the, uh, the comments of people, when they were seeing the first, um, all the people live in the cities is that they were dressed like us. It was not the refugee that are in the Mediterranean rescued from the sea. It is absolutely like us. And this gave a sense of it. This gave also an episode of racism for the poor migrants that were coming to Italy. But this also gave the sense that this was, this could, that life can change in a moment. And even in this developed country that feels so privileged, privil that are so privileged anyway in, in, the, in the world today. And this fear makes that it's very difficult um, to, to keep this uh, in the complex understanding. One, second, women. Women are uh, from the beginning out of the possibility to make a real um, impact because when because it was too late when the war, the, this logic, this senseless logic has started, <clears throat> you are in a different world. You are in a world of another logic, completely other. So where common sense doesn't count, where the idea of common interest for everybody doesn't exist, which the goal of protecting life is not in the landscape, so you are in a state where what is counting is the dynamic of power, of pride, of who is winning, who will win, <clears throat> a total uh, different logic. And so what happens is women are caught in the need to take a stand with what is available, not even uh, trying to keep a different position because there was no time for that. It was too fast in a way. So these different values that we try to embody are very difficult to, 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 make, to, to continue to be visible in a strong way. That is also why we, we were absolutely appalled by the fact that Sweden and Finland, we didn't see any resistance, any sign of the women of feminists against this uh, joining the NATO. So what happens was the land in between, any negotiation, any agreement needs a land in between. And uh, little by little disappeared. This was, apart the women, this was also Europe. So at the beginning, there was an attempt from <clears throat> France, Germany, Germany had also the, in, the inheritance of Merkel who had kept to Putin in the, as Kissinger also will say, in the mm, embrace <laughs> of Europe. Uh, what started, Europe started to be this land in between at the beginning to say, let's try to, to discuss with Putin. And Macron 
had long, long conversation with Putin, Italians too, and Germans too. Britain came in like a tornado, supporting Ukraine, as, as in the Iraqi thing, aligned with the US. It was really a, a tornado against this possibility to be a mediation. Then what happened was that uh, this um, possibility was um, little by little eroded by the <clears throat> quick invasion, by the fact that there was this classic uh, mental uh, perversion to start to use the past history in, a, in another way. So what happened was that Putin was Hitler, and the, the Ukraine was the partisans, was the resistance movement against the invasion, which formally can be the same, but is absolutely not the same. And so the pacifists, like in Italy for sure, but I'm sure also in other um, European countries, trying to say, no, don't send the weapons. That was the point of, of uh, division sending weapons or not sending weapons. We were saying sending weapons will, will only fuel the war. This became, was, was um, treated like a tra uh, betraying the resistance war of the past. So betraying our history against the, against the Nazism. And this uh, using the past in a way which is completely wrong was very powerful in, in our countries. So what happens today? And so just to give you an example of the craziness of the times, uh, one of the answers was that in the University of Milan, they canceled the course on Dostoevsky, on the Russian literature. So this, it was absolutely... Uh, and if you try to say we are not for fueling with new weapons, you would you would be um, labeled right away as a philo Putinian. And many of the leftists in the parliament who tried to go against that were, but in two minutes, philo Putinian. And so philo Russian, and of course, we have an history of Communist Party, <laughs> a commu uh, very powerful in, in 20 years ago, 30 years ago in Europe. So there was a combination of, uh, that was not manipu as manipulation only, was the use of history that made the disappearance of the possibility for European, um, not leaders, because the, to, to, to be this land of mediation. All of a sudden, we became smashed as allied of the, of the, EU, of the Americans, of the EU. And this is the real tragedy I would say of Europe today, that what it was because it is a waste of the history of the the naissance of the birth of the EU, which exactly came to after the Second World War to um, struggle against the war coming from nationalism and. Uh, here we are, just servants of the Americans, just having thrown all this history out of the, of the window. Um, so, uh, of course, there were other responsibilities that civil society or our movements has, have dropped any work on war, all the disarmament, uh, committees, uh, work on against nuclear weapons, against weapons, all that. In a way, after the Iraqi war, that until the Iraqi war, there was a big, massive civil movement, was uh, dormant. Perhaps we thought it was not so necessary. I don't know. Women too. There was a strong women pacifist, completely dormant. 
So that is something we should think about. Also because now we have only three treaties we can count on, the, 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 the 19 for 28 after the First World War and the two on nuclear uh, weapons. And we have to retake all this work on disarmament because it's absolutely in needed. So uh, we have also, so we see, uh, we, among the facts, we can see that uh, weapons industry is making a lot of money. So there are facts that are not truth, but pure facts. So they are making a lot of money that uh, civilians continues to die at a level that is in a way uh, unthinkable in this uh, continent, that um, there are links that have still to be found like, for example, the fact that in Ukraine, from the economic world to the military, the fact that in Ukraine, 10 multinationals have the control of uh, the wheat industry. And so what are they doing there? How they are using this power today? that where we have all this wheat thing going on. And also they are bypassing the veto in the EU to, to grow soya, to grow genetic. Uh, and this is going through Ukraine. So this, the, the landscape, even the, the, the connection between military, economic, and this public opinion that is manipulated to support the pure resistant Ukraine that are invaded, which is true, but it's not only that, is making a very complex uh, uh, landscape and that we have to clarify more. And this is what we try to do. And remember, no, remember, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you the civil uh, society in, Italy, 60% of people don't want to continue the war, but the decision on sending weapons don't go through the parliament and they don't even tell us which kind of weapons they send. And I think the Italians are very old, by the way. And this also, there is a confusion because in the media, you see a very, uh, also perverse combination. You see the trenches. It's a scenery that people like me who was raised in the First World War, it, stories by my pair, my, my grandparents and Second World War, my, my parents, uh, you see the trenches, the bodies, a very old way of old war. So, uh, and at the same time, you have all this technology. And at the same time, you have the bomb and Hiroshima. And then another terrible thing is that now they are starting to discuss about, is it bad or there could be an accident or the Russian will use the bomb, but is it better to use the strategic nuclear or the tactic nuclear? Because one is doing less harm than the other. While the few generals that general, uh, they are retired, they tell you there is not a substantial difference between the tactic nuclear bomb and the strategic because the power they have today towards Hiroshima time are enormous. And what is that is that the, the issue of using the nuclear bomb is legitimized because it's part of the normal discourse. It's not, you are crazy, what are you talking about? No, it's, let's discuss which is the less, the least uh, um, terrible. And it's, uh, I mean, in terms of pedagogy of, of the of zeitgeist of this is a terrible sign of craziness of the real our species that you, we can discuss about that like we discuss about to grow uh, this kind of mushroom or the other is this is really uh, or terrible <laughs> so uh, um 
So as Chomsky says, the combination of stupidity and provocation put all of us in this school de sac, because in this situation, you know, the civil society has no say. Now the EU that could have been this land in between is completely pro-Ukraine, pro-sending weapons, pro-Zelensky. And uh, what is clear to us, some of us, is let's hope, just to put it very roughly, that the Americans will stop Zelensky. Because if we continue with this idea of victory, we are there is no way out in this moment because there is no realism of any kind. There is, and for this reason, there is no exit in a way because the two goals of both are impossible. It's impossible that, I mean, the, the, the sources from Russia say that it's impossible in this moment to think of an implosion of Russia. The Americans are ambivalent on that. You tell me, Leticia, when I'm five minutes before the end, please, because I'm <clears throat> five now. So the 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 um, uh, um, who is um, the Americans are ambivalent because what will happen if there is an implosion of Putin? Even if uh, uh, Biden says that, but then he realized that it was crazy. The victory of Zelensky is impossible, and the victory of Putin in terms of in that terms is also impossible. So, or there is somebody that decide that they have to sit down or this war will continue with no end, unless there, is a, there could be an accident. And that is also the, 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 the escalation, which is uh, worrisome for, also for them. So this is the situation in the field. Now, what is... Um, what I want to point before, uh, uh, there are other things that I wanted to say, but um, uh, I want to put the, the attention to two elements. So I have, if I have only five minutes, that is, uh, we can take at the, after Karina what we can do in terms of keeping the civil society with some voice and women with some voice. But what is really worrisome is the fact that we didn't in this we didn't use the lesson of the of the of the ex Yugoslavia war, because the real danger now is nationalism in the frame of a nationalistic trend all over Europe. So all. Uh, like in the ex Yugoslavia, in Ukraine, Russia knew there was crossing borders, families, they were all Russians in a way, and Ukrainians in the other way. People were living together in peace, talking both languages, crossing borders. Now, all that is are completely erased. And of course, it goes through destruction. It goes through destruction of symbols. It goes through erasing the language, the possibility of using the languages. And it's, a, a pro, it's the, the slipping towards a very dangerous nationalism. The one, purity of race, purity of language, one nation against the other in a framework where in Europe, my president of, uh, calls about, we are a nation. There is a slipping of nationalism in Europe. And in that, in that framework, there is the radicalization of this, of um, the, hate between uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, because now this will be silent. We try to have meetings from women, Ukraine and Russia. We made it was absolutely impossible. And this is what happened in the ex-Yugoslavia. Ex-Yugoslavia also is boiling up. And women were telling us, be aware when, when Ukraine will start also in the, in the in Serbia, in Bosnia, in ex Yugoslavia, things will start to boil up again because there, there was no, not, there is this long standing 
history of nation or purity of language that also the, the ex Yugoslavia is the same they were living all together marrying all to and that war has destroyed the civil society fabric for I don't know for how many I don't know hundreds but for many times finishing and finishing yeah so watch nationalisms thank you so much Paula this is uh, a topic that really stimulates a lot of passion uh, in the United States. We haven't had we haven't had a uh, war surrounding us in the way that Europe has had it in the eyes of and in the hearts of your uh, generational expression. Um, so it's really good to hear and see what you're doing there on the ground. Our next speaker is. Um, Karina Kailo. Karina is an adjunct professor of Ulu University in Finland. She's a writer, a scholar, an eco-activist, politician, ex-professor of women's studies, and a self-made artist who illustrates her books on mythology. She's published hundreds of articles and numerous anthologies or books regarding ecofeminism, the gender impact of neoliberalism, sonnets and sweat lodges, northern women's culture and mythology, the gift imagery, and the bear religion. She has held women's studies position in Canada and Finland as a senior fellow of the Finnish Academy. Most recently, she became the fellow of the Archaeomythologies Institute's European branch. She focuses on peaceful egalitarian cultures, exploring the myth of Terra Feminaria as a pre-patriarchal world of the North. Currently, she also engages in peace studies and was invited as co-chair and plenary speaker to the Badung Belgrade Havana Commemorative Peace Conference in Indonesia. Welcome, welcome, Karina. Thank you very much. Um, for this invitation. And I want to thank Media and Paula for their very impassioned and very insightful analysis of the situation in Ukraine and the aggression of Russia against Ukraine. I don't have to talk about all of the same things now. Um, and so I can focus on solutions and on some other issues that I also brought up in Indonesia. The three uh, week long conference where we went all around Indonesia to visit Sukarno's grave and, and to visit different um, places of peace uh, activism was very important uh, because it was a counter um, movement to NATO involving BRICS and um, NAM, the non aligned movement. And um, mostly people um, analyzed um, the role of NATO in triggering the situation in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we did a resolution, uh, a manifest uh, that was handed over to the G20 summit. And to just um, summarize, um, it um, blamed NATO very strongly in my opinion and um, kind of defended Russia. And I had I found that very difficult uh, to accept as a um, as a um, as a statement because I see that both NATO and Russia are imperialist powers, and uh, you know we have to analyze the deep roots of patriarchy, uh, patriarch patri capitalism, and militarism, and not um, look for victims and uh, main bullies. They are all bullies. But I was very happy that one thing I managed to uh, to accomplish in this um, conference was um, the integration into the manifesto of, of uh, patriarchy and violence against women. It was totally unheard of to talk about violence against women in Indonesia, according to the women there. So, um, and people were very, um, at e Malales, you know, when, when I talked about it, but um, I thought it was very important that patriarchy was recognized as one of the problems that we have to sort out. 
and uh, can you show my PowerPoint now? Um, my, I want to focus now on um, pa patriarchy as a uh, anti-truth movement, which uh, itself is a war system. Next. Um, I think that to understand war and to analyze its deep roots, um, we have to expose the way it is not something anomalous, uh, anomalous, but um, more um, there is a there's very deep connections between the everyday life um, where women are victims uh, of violence and of poverty and so on, and and the war system where these um, ills of patriarchy only become very exaggerated and and very brutal. All of patriarchy is um, a system, system of appropriation, uh, lies, manipulation, and power over. And here I just um, use this image to remind us that uh, war actually, the whole war system started 5,000 years ago, um, the way that we know it, uh, in a reversal, in a conscious reversal of women's ways of living peacefully and uh, the reversal of, of women's powerful symbols of the sacred and of fertility. Next. Uh, the Christian religious appropriation of the sacred and of female fertility and symbols um, is, is an element of this violence that has been done to the matrilinear, matricultural uh, past, um, which has been denied. And it's one of the big uh, lies of patriarchy uh, to suggest that there has never been uh, matriarchies or rather matrilinear, matricultural, matristic societies. And so the matrioshka having been appropriated as a symbol um, is just an epitome of, um, of how history went. And, and this is the history we don't know and we should educate people about it. Next. So I think we can best understand how the current war system and militaristic patriarchy developed if we expose and reveal how patriarchy reversed all the sacred spiritual and life oriented life ways and values of matristic matrilineal metricultural societies of the past. And uh, here I'm referring, for instance, to the writings of uh, Mary Condren, who has written wonderful, uh, very insightful articles about um, uh, women's fertility, uh, spring rituals and how in Celtic Ireland, uh, the whole very whole notion of fertility was taken over and turned into a violent fertility um, bloodshed on the fields, the sacrifice of the sons instead of uh, the menstrual blood that was given to Mother Earth. And, um, and also the gift oriented market of women's economics has been perverted into this notion of the invisible hand of neoliberalism, but actually what, what it does is it puts its hand into the pockets, especially of women and vulnerable peoples, and um, has again, uh, totally reverted the original old European uh, system of trade uh, gifting practiced by women. In this regard, I refer to the studies of Harald Harman, who is the uh, director of the Archaeo Mythological Institute here in Finland, the European branch. And, um, and he has, um, to, together with him, we have started uh, thinking seriously how, how we might use this, um, this new knowledge about the lives of patriarchy and patriarchal history uh, to get people to understand the roots of war, the war system. Um, and um, I, I, um, I have been very um, upset about the fact that as, an, as a feminist activist, peace activist, I have had to witness that in Finland, as in the North in general, the peace movement has died out and all other movements have become very weak from attack to anti-neoliberalism and, and globalization movements. 
And I think there is a fatigue, a battle fatigue among young people. And there have been too many, um, too many problems now with COVID-19, with the war, um, with um, climate change. And I think that uh, young people are desperate and, uh, and also the gender studies, which has become very apolitical and focused more on sexual rights than, than the situation, the global situation. This has led to the loss of the movements um, for peace. And uh, so I put my hope now into what we might do with um, the Aker Mythological Institute by um, educating the young people and giving them hope. I think we need hope also, and not only the horrible revelations about uh, what has happened um, in Ukraine. And this hope is what uh, we get from old Europe and the whole um, exposure of the lies of patriarchy. Harold Harman has written about um, 80 books about uh, prehistory and about democracy before Athens and before patriarchy. And he shows uh, very convincingly all the lies, the manipulations of patriarchy. Uh, and, and, you know, we hope that this will show people that uh, another future and another economic system and peace are possible. And uh, we hope to trigger uh, a new movement um, through networks of uh, education and activism by showing that uh, there existed 3,000 years of peace in Ukraine. Uh, well, the area that involves a lot of other countries uh, today, but in, in 6,000 to 3,000 before uh, common era, um, you know, we, the area now called Ukraine did have a peaceful egalitarian culture as Maria Gimbutas and her followers, John Mahler and Harold Harman, among others, have revealed. Uh, next. Um, so my point here is that war is not something anomalous, <clears throat> but it exists on the continuum of patriarchal economics. And it merely expresses patri capitalism at its worst with peace and wartime, both using lies and manipulation to advance the competitiveness of male oriented business and elite entitlements. All this talk in neoliberalism about um, um, savings and um, privatization and so on uh, to benefit the whole culture is a big lie because it, um, it hides the fact that it just makes uh, the elite richer and the poor become poorer. So it's a conquest oriented um, system that has um, in essence elements in common with, with the war system. Next. Uh, Genevieve has written uh, really important um, things about truth and lying uh, and uh, showing how um, they are part of the uh, opposition of uh, gifting and exchange. And I think that we can apply this aspect of her theory to the current wars as a habit of uh, using lies and words to confuse, mislead and alter the truth. And I am confused as well um, about, it's the first time that I haven't had a very clear sense of, uh, you know, the left and right and center because everything is a mess now. And um, the medias um, are very good at, um, you know, feeding us uh, contradictory information, a very difficult information to, to digest and, um, well, anyway, uh, Jen has written that uh, telling the truth should be seen as other oriented communication, satisfying others communicative needs to know about a situation in order to satisfy their other complex needs. Lying in constant, in, in um, contrast um, is uh, like exchange ego oriented. Like exchange, it uses the other for the satisfaction of the needs of the ego. False advertising is a lie which promotes an exchange. 
objective truth, the correspondence between words and things might be seen as a reflection of equal exchange outside the giving and receiving grain. So in my conclusion here, both traditional wars and economic competition require that we accept lies, manipulation, misinformation, and even alternative truths as uh, Donald Trump has shown us. Next. So the um, solution would be generalizing gifting as the age old women's way of matristic way of, of, of living as opposed to the exchange, which is really self-interest and manipulation. Uh, Genevieve writes that the completion of the gift transaction, the satisfaction of a need can also be extended to the ascertainment of truth and lying. So our challenge is to generalize gift giving, um, to generalize the model of mothering in abundance, to understand the impediments to this generalization and to dismantle them. Next. So 3,000 years of peace in old Europe um, is what can give us hope because um, as I've read uh, quite a lot about um, a mystery of the Danube uh, civilization, it completely changes my understanding of history. And I have found in the North also evidence of the Terra Feminarum, the land of women, which has been uh, denied as, uh, as a mere legend. But even in the 14th century, in the area called Finland, Birger Jarl uh, uh, had, uh, had put into vigor something called woman peace. So in the 14th century, it was forbidden to vi violate women. And the history is full of evidence uh, of a totally different system than what we now take for granted and think as the only possible one. Next. So here I contrast two images of, um, of the way the world can be imagined. The Iroquoian great law of peace and the patriarchal a system with its hierarchies and money elite. And I wonder why the whole school system and university uh, nowhere teaches anything about this distinction between sustainable worldviews and the militaristic patriarchal system that we live under. And I think that uh, as, as uh, Ecofeminist and uh, gifting uh, feminist, uh, it's important that we try to impact on education if the planet is still here, if it matters, uh, that we change the myths from the myth of conquest and heroism, uh, nationhood, um, patriarchy, back towards eco myths where uh, non human people, animals are our companions as they are among indigenous people. And I think that in fact, indigenous people should be the leaders of the change, that, the radical change we need. Next. So because of the environmental collapse, poverty, disease, nuclear weapons, conventional war, lies, oligarchy, uh, because of all of these uh, horrible things that have uh, become even at, even a threat to, to, the exist, to the existence of the very planet, I think that we have to try to work for a change that affects not only politics, well, politics is corrupt. I, uh, I'm a politician, but I'm totally disgusted with um, how even the left um, women in, in some of them, not all of them have agreed to the NATO um, pressures and um, and you know have have sort of uh, gone under the pressure to um, go with the boys, so to speak. 
So the change has to affect representations, mythologies, assumptions about human nature, rituals, culture, and religion, education. And I think that um, as Genevieve has um, role modeled for us, the norm and understanding of human nature must change. So from Homo economicus, which is the, uh, the warrior conqueror type um, human, we must go back to Homo donans, the motherer type human being. And more and more books are coming out actually. Uh, Bragg, uh, Rutgers has written on the, um, on the history uh, of how, how the idea that humans are evil has been uh, in a way um, manipulated um, based on, on uh, statistics that were distorted. And of course, we all know that in economics, in neoliberalism, the idea is that uh, the society benefits the most if everybody looks after their own interest. And Schumpeter, um, the Austrian economist uh, claims, uh, talks about this uh, creative destruction in a way saying that, uh, you know, when, when um, horrible things happen in crisis, uh, um, in economics, it's just a new ground for new investments. So in a way, war is also an opportunity for new investment because when you destroy something, then you have to rebuild it. And that could be that couldn't be further away from the gifting notion that we find among gifting nations and uh, the the women's attitude towards the gift. Next, five minutes left. Okay. Next. Um, so the matrix of patriarchal lies consists in the myth of universal patriarchy, which uh, was still in vigor when I was in university. Uh, you know, even feminists uh, reproduced the argument that there has never been a matriarchy. Well, of course, matriarchy as a domination system, the a mirror image of patriarchy probably hasn't existed, but the kind of egalitarian, peaceful, more peaceful um, matristic cultures have now been discovered. They exist even today. And in Indonesia, of course, um, the Minangkabau um, is still a mat matrilinear uh, society, even though there is a lot of pressure to, uh, to have it turned into an Islamic and patriarchal state. The myth of civilization, starting with patriarchy and the state structure, instead of prehistoric matricultures having invented equality, peace, and balanced life ways, is also part of these um, lies that Harold Harman, among others, has uh, written so much about. Um, we still have this belief that in the past it was just barbarism and uh, even matri uh, Iroquois and matriarchies were an early stage of uh, development as if uh, egal equal um, democratic systems would be a barbaric. So also the, um, the lie is the projection of the exchange logic on everything, including human nature. The idea that we are all greedy, ego-oriented people. Uh, and I already mentioned this um, neoliberal creed that um, the good life is, uh, is possible when we only look after ourselves. Next. So I think that um, studies and activism on this Russian aggression against Ukraine and on war and peace would benefit greatly from recognizing the deep roots of warlike patriarchy. Um, everything that was said here earlier by Media and, and um, Paula is very important. It's very important that we analyze the, the intricacies of what's going on. But I think that um, in traditional peace uh, studies in the university, for instance, they only focus on war. They don't talk about what um, is required for peace and they don't talk about the structures of peace or peaceful societies. And I think that's a big missing point. Um, 
so here I just summarized that um, the war shares key elements of patriarchal exchange. Uh, it's ego oriented versus the common good. And even if you think about um, privatization, the word privare, privatization comes from Latin, means to rob. And we have seen that uh, the economic system we live under is creation of poverty, scarcity, inequality. So it has a lot of ties with, with war. And women, of course, are currency of exchange between soldiers and warring parties with rape as a all but accepted strategy between uh, the men who are fighting in the name of fatherland and male honor. So um, to quote Audrey Lord, you cannot rebuild the master's house with the master's tools. And that's why I think it's very important that in our peace work, we talk about the radically uh, different tools, thoughts, ideas, and practices that are needed in the world. And um, so I, I think that all the non-assimilated, non-patriarchal cultures and citizens should unite. And that includes, of course, all the genders. Not all men are patriarchal, whereas many women are patriarchal. Uh, the, the key thing is to get people to understand the importance of, of gifting and the kind of economic systems and markets that women have created uh, that also served to look after the other, as in Yucatan in Mexico, or sorry, in Latin America. I'm not sure if it was Mexico. Anyway. Um, there's a lot more I would have liked to say, but 20 minutes is too too little time. And these are more like uh, just, you know, it's a re repertoire, it's a menu from which to pick up things that I think are important for us to, to work on together. And we have to really work hard to get the women's movements or, well, can we have women because, can we have a women's movement because some say that there are no women. Well, I think we, we should talk about women and we should talk about, um, all the genders, of course, as well. But um, the key issue is to get men and women and all the genders to side with the gifting philosophy that Genevieve has so generously described. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. You brought um, the maternal gift economy and the truth of the gift in war and peace right here at the conclusion. So I really appreciate that so much. Genevieve, I wonder if you had any thoughts that you wanted to share at this moment as we begin to open up to some of the questions. Uh, and then uh, after you speak, I'll check in with the speakers to see if they have questions for each other. And then we'll go to Liliana for whatever time we have for questions. Jen. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful uh, analysis and uh, and uh, impassioned uh, thinking on all of this. Um, my only uh, addition, I guess, or if that is even the case, because Karina brought it up a lot, is uh, that that uh, the gift is the uh, the truth is a gift because it satisfies the other person's need to know. Uh, lying is an exchange because it uses what it gives in order to get back the, uh, something for the, for the speaker's own advantage. And uh, that has really, we, we can see that very much in the, these wars because there are wars of truth and exchange. The, the wars of exchange, war is an exchange because you hit somebody and they hit you back. And it goes on and on, like vengeance is, a, is an exchange. Uh, and so our, our war activity fits with our economic activity. And uh, it occupies our minds. And the way out is really telling the truth as much as we possibly can, as, as you three have done uh, on this, uh, in this evening's uh, 
uh, uh, seminar. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I'll just I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jen. Um, let me just check in with Medea. Did you have any questions or additional comments before we open to questions? Uh, I have a question for Paula about the future of Europe, because I was asked this uh, and I didn't know what to ask, to, how to respond. They said, you know, how is this remaking alliances in Europe and uh, might it be pushing Europe like Macron has wanted to have its own, quote, security architecture? Um, is it empowering the right, as you were uh, talking about the growth of nationalism? Will you see more movements like in Italy uh, and in Sweden to the right? How do you see Europe 20 years from now? Um, can we, should I answer now? Can we embed the answer later? I want to think uh, in the framework of the other people talking if possible. So I will be. Okay. And so I will put also my, not a question, but my, yeah, my uh, one comment that I would like. When I was um, talking about nationalism, I was really thinking of patriarchal values and the fact that, you know, it's nationalism, blood, land, mother, um, sacrifice, killing and dying for uh, with uh, some ideals that are very, where women are used in the imaginary very strongly. So to, to analyze that is very important for the, for the progression or regression of war. And also, I wanted to ask, uh, I have a question on that. This is to, make, to Medea. Do you think that Biden has the slight, Biden or the Americans that have the slightest idea of what, um, what the Russian culture is in terms of values and way of thinking? Because my sense is that they are using the meter of the US, uh, you know, and they don't understand how deep cultural, deeply cultural, this issue of reconstructing the, you know, the big Russian uh, national, the big Russian nation, big um, that keeps together East and West is important, and is part of the impossibility to negotiate because um, the recognition issue is so important for Russians. I mean the Russian culture has to be in the stood also to be able to negotiate. So that is a question to you, Medea. And to answer quickly, uh, no, I have to think about the European future. <laughs> so uh, it, in answering your question, I think it, it uh, brings up what you were talking about in your uh, presentation about manipulation of history and also uh, selective um, taking of, of culture uh, to justify uh, the um, lack of willingness to talk. So from the Biden US media point of view, uh, Putin only wants to recreate the uh, Soviet empire. And so if you let him get his way in Ukraine, he will go on to take these other countries. And of course, having Finland and Sweden wanting to join NATO uh, plays right into that because it says to the American public uh, that all of these countries believe uh, that uh, the Russians want to uh, have their um, empire that will extend over all of Europe if allowed to do that. And um, I wonder, Karina, when you said people are tired, there's not protesting. Um, and it's interesting you brought in COVID because I think we don't take that into account enough uh, when we look at just how society is, is feeling these days and the exhaustion and the fear. Um, but uh, as uh, I think Paola would agree that we've been astonished by uh, the lack of a peace movement in Finland and Sweden 
uh, we think of you all as very these strong, strong women uh, with a strong history of being peacemakers, peace builders, um, and uh, you know, seeing that kind of collapse uh, has been quite shocking. So that also feeds into my question about uh, where, what is the the future of Europe? Was Thanks, that a Medea. question to me? Yeah, to both of you. <laughs> yeah, Karina. Yeah, it's heartbreaking to see the welfare state being dismantled. And I, I blame uh, also the, the gender uh, studies. Uh, it has gone in, in the wrong direction. Uh, it has um, been assimilated into neoliberalism to a great extent. And the focus on um, on, on sexuality, sexual rights, um, somehow, you know, talking even about the women's movement uh, or mothering is, is, is a risk, uh, you know, because it's, you, you, you get blamed for being an essentialist or old fashioned or something, um, you know, postmodernism and, um, and neoliberalism have, have done a lot of harm, I think, to the peace movement and the women's movement. And, um, and also, well, I don't know, I had, haven't fully analyzed it, but um, I, I still think it's battle fatigue. I've seen less and less people in the activist movement and uh, not no young people, uh, not enough young people uh, replacing the old school. And, um, that's why I feel that we have to do something, um, something differently. We have to, to bring up uh, hope in a big way, uh, because a lot of young people have said to me, "What's the point anymore? You know, the planet is lost. Uh, you know, there's uh, huge forest fires in Russia. Methane gas is being re uh, released uh, in um, in Russia." Uh, there are so many bad news that there is a sort of uh, desperation in the air. And it's a very serious situation. It's true. I mean, also the, the strong Nordic women, I think um, the problem with um, the Nordic countries is that the equality that uh, is typical is um, one of becoming um, equal to men and becoming like men. So there is not that much of a spiritual movement, <clears throat> although it is coming now. Um, so the women specific um, women's movement uh, is very slow in coming to Finland and to, to Sweden and other countries. It, women have been, you know, assimilated into patriarchy in a big way and they're successful there. They are ministers, they are presidents, but um, the gifting side, the what makes um, the women's culture very peaceful and egalitarian has has not followed with the the gains in equality. Thanks, Karina. Let's um, let's go to Liliana and see if she can't find. There are many comments and questions, but Liliana, can you pull one out and present it for our? speakers here yes i have a question or comment from ruth Miran, and she's talking about nato without nato it would be very difficult to rally against putin so far seems too simplistic to simply disband disband nato we will need publicity on budgets local stand-ups like singing revolution monthly weekly bring grassroots into awareness and action? Well, I see those as two different things. One on the NATO issue, uh, I, I do think that um, Europe deserves and needs its own uh, defense system, but it shouldn't be with the US. Uh, and that's why NATO is so dangerous because it's run by the US. It's also so dangerous because it has a stated goal that countries have to spend more of their GDP on the military. And while 2% might sound 
like a little, it's actually a huge number when you think of all the economic activity that goes into defining a GDP. Uh, and most European countries had not before this war, um, quote, achieved that goal because there has been such a backlash that countries don't want to, in Europe, don't want to be like the United States where we spend all this money on the military. But unfortunately, with the U uh, Russian invasion, uh, it's now uh, given a big push in spending. So I think that the uh, future of security for this planet really needs to uh, have NATO be um, phased out and uh, Europe have its uh, its own, um, I mean, I would love us to have no militaries, uh, but as we move in that direction, uh, I, I just would like to see the US separated from Europe because the US design and part of the reason for uh, the geopolitics of this war is to uh, pull Europe away from Russia uh, of course, in the uh, when it comes to energy, that's been a, a obvious focus. But to have the market be more exclusive towards uh, the U.S. Uh, and to stop this uh, multipolarization of the world, which is inevitable that it's going to happen, but I think the U.S. is is trying to delay that by weakening Russia and then having its sights set on China, which NATO is also doing. NATO talks about China as the number one adversary. So that's why I feel NATO is so dangerous. And in terms of the other parts of your comments, if we need things with singing and all kinds of other creativity, absolutely. So let's think of something we could do on International Women's Day that would be a creative response to the insanity of war. Beautiful. Thanks, Medea. I see that Karina has her hand up and then we'll go to Paula. Yes, I wanted to add that um, it's quite ironic that the media in Finland talk about um, the lack of a free speech in Russia and, and how Putin um, punishes anybody who is uh, not in agreement with, with him. But at the same time in Finland, uh, you know, regarding NATO, there's only one voice that's acceptable. It's not really, well, we, we do have free speech and nobody goes into prison for opposing NATO, but um, there's been a manufacturing of consent, you know, to use Chomsky's term, um, you know, so uh, we are in a situation where billions have been given to the military uh, to make it, um, you know, fit the NATO requirements. At the same time, like I said earlier, the hospitals um, are in big crisis. The elderly people are not taken care of. Uh, the welfare state is really being uh, outsourced and um, weakened. And where does the money go? It goes into arms trade, uh, arms uh, acquisition. So it's really tragic. And um, because of this manufacturing of consent and that, that there are so many, so few consenting voices, I feel quite quite desperate about this. And to be honest, I, I try to do art to survive mentally because if I think only about all these horrible things, you know, I, I, I become inactive. I can't do anything. I become paralyzed because it's so serious. So I'm just trying to survive. I'm 70, you know, how, how many years do I have left? You know, maybe I should also enjoy life a little bit and enjoy it by doing <laughs> activism by, doing quilt work and, and painting or something, uh, still doing activism, but doing in a way that, uh, you know, I'm, well, I think, you know, I can't handle so many traumas anymore. So I, I don't watch all of the ho horrors coming from Ukraine, but instead I help the Ukrainian families here. I've made friends with, with, with one particular family. So that, that is the therapeutic when, when you want to do something, but you don't know what you can do. Thanks, Karina. Um, Paola, and then we'll check in with Jen to see if she has any comments that she'd like to offer. Paola, you need to Perfect. unmute. I just wanted to answer now to Medea and no, okay. I am an unable instead to 
to to get out from this uh, trying to uh, to find a way to find a way <laughs> and where also feminist because now we are full of women in power here and there but feminism that was a different project of society and uh, I, inside which the gift economy was part of feminism feminism is you are right, Karina. This post-modern, uh, uh, also intragender, civil rights-only stuff has destroyed the political aspect of feminism. That was anti-neo, anti-liberal, anti-anti-market. Anyway, I think, Medea, that Europe is done with the last uh, scandal. In uh, in the in the European uh, being uh, the Italians and the Greek just for a change now for now being bought by Qatar uh, we are uh, the EU has has another blow the question is why now and of course complotist people think that this is could be also from the Americans because what is clear is that. The US doesn't want a strong Europe. This uh, land, what they call a land in between, taking the best, let's say the best, because the, the sense of having to understand the other as other. And there is something in the European tradition which is less, um, even if uh, the conquest of the U America has, uh, exported the worst of European values, but there is something in the European tradition that also the Western European tradition and writings and that is still um, able to see the otherness. While uh, my sense is that the, the, the US has become more and more blind to the uh, to the to try to even understand the other perspective so but my sense is that today uh, europe for now is done i don't see any um, future because they don't uh, we don't have the strength to go against if, to go against the plans that the americans have for us to be there Point, their basis, their point of against Russia and China in this side geopolitically. And uh, so I don't see the conditions now to do that, even if this is what we have to, to struggle for. But uh, you know what, uh, I don't remember who said that. Um, they said, you know, the, is the multipolarism and the bipolarism and the monopolarism is the issue. If the Americans will become the, try to become the only pole of power and they cannot do that, they say, somebody said, they will be involved more and more in altruistic wars. <laughs> you become the only pole. So it could be also in their own interest to allow, I, I, but I don't see now the conditions, no. Uh, now our real enemy is not to allow not to allow the the right to take over. I would say. Thanks, Paula. Let's can see I, if can I just mention one thing, uh, Paula. That uh, while you say Europe is done, we look to the demonstrations happening in places like Italy and uh, Germany, and many other places. Uh, thinking that there is life there, that there are strong trade unions that get out on the streets. There, the protests against inflation are also protests against fueling the war in Ukraine. So we are inspired by what happens in, in Europe. <laughs> oh, yeah, because compared to the U.S. Uh, civil society, we are very strong. We can take <laughs> into the streets a million people, but we don't count anything now. So the problem is, how to count. Now, uh, just for, I think it's important that they say that the, the terrible harm of this la latest scandal is that the, the person who is corrupt 
was the head of an NGO. So an NGO whose title was fight against impunity. So the real people, the real, apart the EU uh, people, power people, the, the NGO are really have a terrible blow of credibility. And this is only for one NGO because the other NGO who are in the streets and saving the migrants and so on are very good. So we have, we are from, we have attacks from many, many sides in this moment. Anyway, yes, we are in the streets all the time. That's true. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Paola and <clears throat> Medina. Um, Jen, <clears throat> would you like to offer our thoughts on this comment? No, I just like to ask uh, who bombed the uh, Russian pipelines, the Russian gas pipelines? The Is that a rhetorical question or are you looking for the truth? <laughs> I'm looking for the truth. Okay. All right. Does anyone know Medea, Paula, Karina? Uh, there's this great uh, cartoon that. Um, I'm just looking for it now, but basically it came out and it said, uh, who opposed the pipeline to begin with? USA. Uh, who said, oh, here it is. Who hates the pipelines, the Russian pipeline, USA? Who tried to stop them? USA. Who said they would destroy them? USA. Who benefits from their destruction? USA. Who destroyed them? We have no idea. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> That all, it really I have no be, idea. Lots of people should be protesting this because Europe is suffering from the from the cold and uh, and from the lack of uh, gas be, heating. So there really should be a huge opposition, but it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, no, it matters, but they decided to go elsewhere, try to become uh, independent from USA and from Russia. And so people are going around Qatar, uh, Algeria, and so on to get the gas somewhere else. But uh, about the pipelines, the best geopolitical guy that has a very interesting review says, this will never come out exactly for the same reason you are describing. <laughs> and Genevieve, I was just in uh, Texas and you know, Diane Wilson, the great environmentalist, uh, I was with her and uh, we were uh, traveling. Uh, well, I traveled around the, the Gulf Coast there and they showed me the new uh, terminals being built, the expanding of the ports there. And it's all in the name of helping our brothers and sisters in Europe who are suffering as a result of uh, the Russian invasion. So uh, it's really so uh, just um, uh, horrific about how the expansion of dirty energy uh, is um, happening uh, on the backs of the suffering of the people in Ukraine and the inflation and the, and the harm being caused in Europe. But uh, the US companies are definitely profiting from the blowing up of the pipeline. So, I think motive alone, Genevieve, should tell us who did it. Absolutely. Yeah. Karina, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I shouldn't be um, bad mouthing the, the female government, the petty host government or lipstick government that we have, because uh, Sana Marin, our prime minister, uh, just yesterday said that uh, she will do everything in her power to put a, um, limit on how much the electricity companies can charge us because people are really now suffering. You know, the price of electricity has gone uh, up just, um, you know, in an unprecedented way. And it's really cold, it's minus 20, um, even here uh, where I live. And uh, I use wood, the old fashioned wood to, to heat my house. Uh, and um, but not everybody can do that. So, you know, people have had bills of thousand euros a month and um, there's an uh, outcry like 50,000 people um, wrote to the government that you have to do something about this. But this is this is an opportunity also to show how capitalism 
um, takes uh, advantage of people's misery. And uh, I think the church, if any institution should pro protest this kind of, um, you know, uh, abusing the anguish of people uh, to make more money. So it really shows, uh, you know, the patriarchal capitalism, capitalism is really showing very clearly its colors at this moment. And I hope it's a wake up call to a lot of people. But uh, unfortunately, according to the polls, the right wing party is the most popular one, despite all of this. It's a yeah. mystery. It's a mi mystery to me, you know, but um, people seem to be self destructive. Yes, or I they think, don't know, or I don't know, mm -hmm. I give up. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's really hard to say <clears throat> that, you know, we're all human. And the physiology, what ends up happening when we are inundated with massive amounts of information, people go into information overload, and then they don't know what to do or where to begin. And as each of you, uh, Medea, Paula, Karina and Jen all continue to point out, this is a, a an interrelated systemic problem at the root, at the very root, which Medea pointed out with NATO, this whole idea that if the United States is requiring anybody who joins NATO to put money into military, we are funding wars. So this is you know, these are very complex ideas, and then we see the suffering. So what I want everyone to sort of feel at this moment when it's dark, we're moving into winter solstice, it's the darkest time, it feels very uh, unsettling to begin with, it's to take a breath and to find the root of the truth, like where your heart really is right now in this place of peace. You know, that's the truth. As women, that's what we need to reach for is this way that we can work together to find a solution and hold each other in this dark time like women did in all wars throughout time. It really is the female, the mother, where, where this response can come from the deepest way, the gifting way. And every, you know, when I heard Medea speak about, you know, uh, people working towards a uh, a ceasefire, you know, for the holidays, that's a place that we can put our energy to, you know, there are ways that we can begin to shift our consciousness and find people who can help us move from this fear of war to this activism towards peace. You know, this is the truth that we need to see. And sometimes the truth of war is horrific. But we do need to have, like what Karina said, places that we can rest in. Like Medea is in Florida. Look at, she's wearing short sleeves where everybody else is freezing. So, so we need to find places where we can get comfort and still do our work. So um, I'm checking the time. We have 10 minutes left and I would like, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have much time for questions and answers because this is a huge topic. And I've watched the chat and looked at the Q&A and there are some very deep questions. Um, and I wanna assure our uh, participants here that we will make sure that our speakers have your questions and answers and hopefully we'll be able to have uh, follow-up um, perhaps even another discussion salon in 2023 after the holidays where we can come back to these and, and find some renewed uh, energy after the holidays. But for now, I would love to have the speakers um, kind of close us out here with some, some added thoughts. And I want to appreciate the truths that you've all presented that seem very dire, but I know that you do this work because you have a sense of commitment and faith towards peace. So I wonder if you could each sort of give us some closing words. Medea, would you like to go first? Uh, 
I see um, that somebody put in the chat wanting to know the role of Israel, and I just wanted to uh, say how ironic it is that some of the uh, most uh, uh, repressive and authoritarian governments like uh, in Turkey, Erdogan, and, uh, in, and Israel and Modi in India are the ones coming forward to help mediate in this crisis. <laughs> Uh, and isn't it a sad uh, reflection on the state of the world that there are no women that have that kind of authority to come forward and uh, be the mediators? Because certainly um, uh, the men have done such a terrible job, uh, although Erdogan has uh, helped in some of this mediation. Uh, I think because... Um, you know, we can't, uh, uh, even though the United Nations says that women have to be involved in peacemaking, uh, it unfortunately uh, rarely happens. And at the peace table, we probably will have uh, a majority, if not all men. Um, so our role, it seems, is to be building up this groundswell of support for an end to the war. And I do see it starting to happen uh, very slowly in the United States, where the opinion polls are starting to change uh, with people each month uh, starting to question whether uh, this makes sense to keep adding fuel to the fire. Uh, and uh, I feel like um, uh, the same is happening in Europe as the uh, energy prices that both uh, Karina and Paula have talked about uh, really start hitting people uh, in the pocketbook, uh, they start questioning whether this is all making sense. And um, so I see us moving in the right direction, uh, but I wonder uh, and hope that we can do more to speed that up. And that's why I threw out this idea of International Women's Day, because I think it is a good time to uh, reclaim the uh, women and, and other allies standing up together to uh, call for peace. And I also wonder if there's some place in Europe that uh, could uh, call women physically together um, to be discussing how we can do more, work more together. Um, over here in the U.S., there's a great need, I feel, to uh, reach out to our allies in Europe and do more work together, whether it's virtually or in person or doing similar kinds of things at the same time, like on March 8th. Beautiful, thanks, Medea. Uh, Karina, would you like to go next? Yes, I, um, I noticed somebody wanted to know how men feel about um, how they fare in um, matriarchies or matristic cultures. And I think, um, I think it's an important thing that we convince uh, men also um, about the good life in these matristic uh, old European and indigenous cultures. Um, I wanted to tell you that uh, Matrix, the um, Ottawa based uh, journal of matriculture has an issue coming out next year precisely on this topic of men in, patri in matriarchy. And uh, my experience so far has been that um, men fare quite well um, in, in this atmosphere of cultural activities and um, uh, you know, in, in a culture where you don't have a division between um, you know, male economics and female care work but where anybody can fulfill their role in any way they want. And also fa fatherhood is, is not, um, men are not oppressed, even though uh, the uncle is the model of the, of the man in the family, in, in the matrilineal societies. There's a lot of freedom, much more freedom than in patriarchy. So I think that it would be very interesting to find out uh, the good things about uh, male experience in 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 matriarchy. And maybe we should start writing more about that too, because we have um, in the women's movement focused a lot on on how well women fare in the matrilineal system. So 
let's not forget about the men and maybe we should inspire them to move into a different uh, culture than patriarchy because patriarchy is bad for men too. Thanks. Thanks, Karina. Paola. Um, I, I, it's very nurturing to be here with you and share what our, our, no, our terrible uh, thought, in a way, one. And second, I, from the beginning um, of the war, what I was thinking, and even I think I tried to contact Medea, was that if we had been able to do a spectacular something, women, but you know, in a way, really going to the borders, something spectacularly together with the Russians, because at that time we had contact with the Russians, but now I think they are too repressed. So they have a basis in London, but if we could set up something really different and big, and that could, uh, could be more than the caravans for peace that we have normally going to Ukraine and taking hell. Yes, I think we should look at something um, daring, you know, from the point of view of women uh, bodies of, you know, saying you are in another world. We are another world. And we are in this moment just uh, victims. No, we are not victims. We are also subjects of another imaginary for the future. But then little by little, I thought that it was very difficult. <laughs> so we can retake that. And uh, there is a trans, but something is coming up, the transnational, there is a transnational assembly that had already two meetings, one in Sofia and one in Frankfurt next month. And uh, I hope uh, it's not the women only, but uh, there is a feminist component, a strong one. So let's keep in touch. Wonderful. Thank you, Paola. Jen. Yeah, I, I agree. It would be a great thing to have an international uh, women's action located in many different places in the world. And uh, I'm thinking of both of Vandana Shiva in, in India, who I think is organizing something for Women's Day. And uh, also um, I'm thinking particularly of the Kurdish women and their alternative society that they've already constructed and that is being attacked again and again by the Turks. and. <laughs> and so I just wanted to say that that we should use as our our um, slogan their slogan, which is Jin Jian Adzadi, which means women, life, and freedom, and that is going all over the world now. So we I would like to just say it again, Jin. John Azadi. We'll say it on Women's Day. Thank you, Jen. What is happening in Iran? We have to watch that. Really? Yes. Great. Great. Yeah, they're using that slogan too. Yeah. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, we've hit the top of the hour. So I just want to thank all of our speakers, Medea Benjamin, Karina Kailo. Paula McGiori, Liliana for providing the questions. And there were so many good questions and comments in the chat. I'm, um, our, I want to thank Diane and Elena who do our tech and Diane will, I hope, make sure that your comments and the questions will also be posted when the video recording is available at our website. I want to thank Genevieve Vaughn and the International Femin uh, the International Feminists for the Gift Economy for your ongoing work and support so that we can actually shift the paradigm. That's what Medea and Paola and Karina and Jen have all been talking about. We need to have this new paradigm, uh, a new vision for the future that's sustainable, the gift everywhere. 
And uh, I want to just thank each of you for joining us. This is a very challenging topic, but there's such a need. I can see from the comments, there's such a need for our voices to be heard. So I want to encourage you to please reach out to your friends, your neighbors, find your networks. If you don't have a peace network there, please create one. I wanted to let you know that we're going to be taking a break. This is our third year uh, the International Feminist for the Gift Economy and our salon. So we're going to be taking a break um, beginning uh, on the 18th through pretty much the whole month of January to give everyone a nice winter. <laughs> Perhaps a new book will come from Jen, who knows? But we know that in the spring that something new is gonna be rising. So please keep an eye on our website. The video recording from today's salon is gonna be posted at our website, the maternal gift economy movement.org. So you can always review this recording and many others um, while we're on our break. If you'd like to be notified um, when we're going to begin again and other events, you can write to us um, and join at the website our mailing list. Questions and comments can all, we encourage them. So please send them to us at maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com. And next year we have some really exciting things. I just wanna say, uh, I'll highlight that we do have Heidi Gutner abendroth her new book uh, on modern matriarchal studies has been uh, translated into English. So we'll be having a special event for her in March. So please, and Jen, what else? I just wanted to say, no, Heidi's book is actually on the origins of patriarchy. So we all need to know that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really getting to the root. So with that, I wanna wish everyone happy holidays. We're gonna see you in the new year. So please be safe, be well. Uh, be kind to one another and work towards peace, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take good care. See you Thank next you year. Happy holidays. It was great. <laughs>